longer reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 2. Feel free to please be seated. This is a longer reading. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that same time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star uh, as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and the teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can worship him as well. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. They went ahead of them and stopped with the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. And they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, Get up! Flee to Egypt with the child and his mother! Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken to the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted that they are dead. The Gospel of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord, you know this part, come on. <laughs> Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. This is the day when we look at uh, this image of Jesus as a good shepherd. And one of the most important parts of being a shepherd, uh, as we see Jesus fulfilling that role, is not just protecting and feeding the sheep, but also being an advocate for sheep. Advocacy defined as this. It's giving voice to those whose voice cannot be heard to speak on behalf of the poor, the neglected, the powerless, or the victimized. Over the years, we've learned uh, that it's not just important to speak on their behalf, but to use our actions, our privilege, our power, our resources, to make it so that the voices of these people can be heard. It's one of the main missions, uh, missions of uh, Lutheran Social Services in Illinois. <laughs> I'll explain to you about all the wonderful things that they do. We have a video here. Go ahead and show the video. Recently, I was reminded of a years ago public service announcement that asked, it's 10 p.m., do you know where your children are? And that caused me to think, to those who support Alice's I know their gifts are making a difference. How much good is being done morning, noon, and night? at Nechusa Home are making breakfast for the teens who live in our residential treatment home. Parents begin dropping off their preschoolers at our Head Start sites in three Chicago neighborhoods. Former prisoners work in community gardens as part of the Elsa Society's re-entry program for returning citizens. A caseworker takes one of the children in our foster care program to visit a sibling who has been placed in another home. Lutheran Disaster Response to Illinois offers a workshop at a local church teaching families what they can do to prepare 
for an emergency situation. Un miembro voluntario de Women's Networks trabaja en un proyecto de caridad para beneficiar a los niños que están al cuidado de LSSI. A development officer has lunch with the donor, bringing her up to date on the LSSI project she helped fund. LSSI supporters meet with lawmakers in Springfield to advocate for social service programs. Volunteers work with incarcerated parents on the Storybook Project. Residents at the Shady Oaks in Homer Glen make a batch of Caliborn. Residents gather at one of LSSI's affordable housing sites for low-income seniors and the disabled. The Head Start students gather their belongings as they wait for their family members to pick them up. Residents at LSSI's group homes for adults with disabilities sit down and enjoy dinner together. Counselors meet with school-based children and their parents. Evenings are often the only time when families can receive mental health services without disrupting their work or school schedules. An LSSI expert in our foster care program is called to the emergency room. The child has had a severe allergic reaction. She stays with the family for hours until the medical crisis is over. Hundreds of foster parents across the state are doing what any other parent does, helping with homework, giving baths, preparing lunches for the next day, and convincing reluctant children to go to bed. Staff members at the Oaks and Juliet assist memory care residents with their medications and bedtime preparations. A new patient registers for LSSI's medically assisted detox program in downtown Chicago. An elderly patient with dementia is up roaming his house in the dark. An LSSI touch worker is there and makes certain he doesn't hurt himself. Una madre adoptiva conforta a un niño que acaba de despertar de una pesadilla y lo ayuda a regresar a dormir. Police officers bring a confused and aggressive man to the emergency room in Chicago. He is evaluated by all society staff members from Project Impact. The new patient checked into detox at 11 p.m. and is still awake, questioning whether she made the right decision to come into treatment. Nurses at Shady Oaks and Homer Glen make their early morning rounds. Many of the residents live with cerebral palsy and must be turned in their beds to prevent bed sores. An adult who was adopted as an infant lies awake, eager and anxious. She's about to meet her birth mother after working with LSSI's search and reunion services. Thank you so much for making a difference in our round-the-clock ministry across Illinois. We are the gospel. We are the good news. We are Christ in the world. Please give generously to support LSSI's Round the Clock Ministry. In the Gospel story I just read, it's the story from Matthew chapter 2 about what happens after the birth of Jesus. Now, most of us here are all right, familiar with the story of how Jesus was born. Mary becomes pregnant, although she's not been with her husband, she's not married. And, but her and Joseph are forced to travel across the country, across the desert, to Bethlehem in order to give birth. Why did they have to go to Bethlehem? Because a powerful man, 5,000 miles away in Rome, says, I want everybody to be in one place, in a specific place, because I want to know how many subjects I have. So Mary's life, and Joseph's life, is greatly disturbed because of this man's wishes. They have to travel, and when they arrive in Bethlehem, what happens? There's no room in the inn. Now, one of the most overlooked things about the story is, why in the world are Mary and Joseph staying in an inn? He's going to Bethlehem because it's a census, and he's going there because that's his hometown, and it's not just him that's going there. Everybody that Joseph is related to has to return to Bethlehem in order to be counted. So somewhere in Bethlehem, Joseph must have relatives. Why is he not staying with relatives? Why is Mary not staying there? I think the answer is obvious. It's because well, there's a scandal going on. She's pregnant, they're not married, this is not the kind of thing you do. And they're not staying in my house, those kind of people. It's really one of the, 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 when we realize that Joseph really should have relatives, and they really should be opening the door to them and being hospitable and caring for a woman who's eight, nine months pregnant, that we realize how alone Joseph and Mary must feel, how abandoned they are as they are searching for a place to stay and can't find anything, they must stay in a small cave where animals are kept. It is there that Jesus is born, just the two of them, and the angels, and the shepherds, and the angels, and those five visit. But certainly, no one that Joseph and Mary know. 
Jerusalem. While they're still in Jerusalem, they're told via a dream that the king is going to kill their child. So they have to run. They have to run away to a foreign country, to Egypt. And thus we learn that Jesus and Joseph and Mary are refugees. They're displaced people who have to flee in order for their own safety, against their own wishes, to a foreign land where they don't speak the language, they don't have a home, they don't have family, they don't have a network of friends, they have no job, they have nothing. And they're forced to do this because of the hatred of another man who is in power. Imagine what it must feel like to be rejected by your family and to be forced to flee your own country for the safety of your child. The plight that Joseph and Mary and Jesus experienced is the plight that many refugees across our world experience today. This idea of people being displaced is not old, it's not new, it's been going on throughout the history of mankind. And that happens today, too. You can think about what it was like when they arrived in Egypt. They don't speak the language, so everything is foreign, everything is different, everything is not the way it should be. And that's hard. Imagine what you would feel like if you had to move to Thailand and you knew no one, you were forced to go there, and you had nothing. No connections, no networks, no friends that will help you out. When they get there, they have no home, so they've got to find a place to, 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 to stay. I have no idea how they do that. And Joseph obviously has to find work because he's got to provide for his family. But you know how this goes, right? He's a tradesman, he's a carpenter. He goes there and he's desperate, so he's going to do anything. How do you think the carpenters in Egypt are going to receive Joseph, who's going to work for a far cheaper wage than they're going to work? They're not going to take kindly to that, are they? This is true throughout the history of mankind. This is a, whatever local union was going on in Egypt at the time, they were not going to approve Joseph's work, and they were going to make life difficult for him. Why? Because that's what people do. That's the life of a refugee. So how do you think they existed? How did they survive? How did they make it for those two, three years living in Egypt? displaced and alone, living the life of a refugee, living from hand to hand, from day to day. Well, one resource that they had was the wise men. You see, the wise men were foreigners, and they're not really wise men, they're astrologers, let's call them what they really are. They're not kings, they're not wealthy, they're not powerful people, they are just people who look at the stars and predict things. Try to read the stars and figure out what's going on. They're astrologers or astronomers, one of the two. And they come because they want to find what in the world is going on. There's, a, there's something unique happening in, in, in Israel. Something special is going on, and we want to worship this person who's been born. So they go there, not being Jewish, not being connected to Joseph and Mary, having no real connection whatsoever to the scene and the situation that's going on there, having no stakes. But they go and they see the truth of the situation. So what do they do? They give what they have, some gold, some frankincense, some myrrh, to Joseph and Mary. What do you think Joseph and Mary did with those gifts? They sold them for food, to pay the cost of running away to Egypt, to somehow survive, and they didn't hold on to those gifts. No one would in that situation. And here we have this story of refugees fleeing their country because their son is about to be killed. They have no choice in the matter. They're not going to try and steal work from the people in Egypt. They're not going because they want to, to experience the sunny, wonderful weather in Egypt. They're going because they have no choice. Yet, the only people they're willing to advocate for them are these three wise men slash astrologers who recognize the situation, the truth of what's going on, and they provide what they have in order to speak and to act on behalf help these refugees. You notice what the wise men don't do. They don't go back to Jerusalem. They don't go before Herod and say, hey, you got to stop this right now. What you're doing is unjust and wrong. Well, of course they don't. They have no power. They can't change what Herod is going to do. But they do do what they can do. They take the time to notice, to use what they have, the resources, the power, the privilege, the standing, the connections, whatever they have, that 
is what advocacy is all about. Sometimes we can't change the world. The wise, the wise men could never do anything to change Herod's heart. So they avoid him, which was smart. They are willing to be advocates for Joseph and Mary and Jesus. I thought about this today because today is Good Shepherd Sunday, and it's the day when we are to be able to think about what it means for us to be shepherds. Because Jesus labels himself the Good Shepherd, and he does that in the context of the, the, the passage John we read, because the people who were supposed to be following God, the religious people of the day, weren't. They were being horrible shepherds, and people were being victimized. People were being hurt. People were being neglected. People were being left alone. There were too many obstacles, social obstacles, that were preventing people from experiencing God. And Jesus couldn't stand it. So he says, you guys got it, the disciples, to the people. You got to see, I'm the good shepherd. This is what it means to be a good shepherd. And then he turns to his disciples and says, hey, you're my friends. You're the people who I've chosen. You are the people that I'm going to hand this ministry on to. Because you are to be shepherds as well. Part of being a good shepherd is being an advocate. Is being able to see the truth of the situation in our lives. Not to be blinded by our own success. Not to be blinded by our own wealth. But to see the reality of what is happening. That people indeed truly are suffering. And refugees are not being refugees by choice. They're not coming to try and steal our good life. They're coming. They have no other choice. In the last five years, four and a half million people have been displaced from Syria. Four and a half million out of a population of less than 20 million. Those people are going and running away from their country by land and by sea on little rafts, walking through desert and turmoil. Why? Because they have no other choice. It is that or it's to be victims of a chemical kind of attack. It's, it's that or to die. The voice of Jesus is telling us, I am the good shepherd. These are the people I long to have. And you are the people I'm calling to help alongside them. We can't change the world. We can't change what is going on in Syria. But we can take time to be like the wise men and stop. To see the reality and the truth of the world around us. To notice what is happening and say, I want to help. I want you to help. Amen? Amen. Our takeaways from today. First one is this. Advocacy is about using whatever we have our position in the world, our job, our resources, our networks, our friends, our privilege, our power, our wealth, whatever we have, so that those who are being victimized, those who are powerless, so that their voice can be heard. And the second takeaway, I just wanted to read to you just four scriptures for you, just to help us to understand the passion that God has on this subject. From Proverbs chapter 31. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Go to the next one. From Isaiah. Learn to do right, to seek justice, to defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. From Jeremiah chapter 22. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of his oppressor, the one who is being robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the alien, to the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this space. And finally, from 1 John chapter 3, this is part of our reading for today. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with our words or our speech, with actions and truth. Let's stand for our song of the day. Um.